Hey Snackers, continuing on our DevNet Sandbox series, do you want to learn the evolution of Cisco DevNet Sandboxes from technology verticals to solution based? Hear software engineering technical leader Mike Mackay talk about what it takes to create a sandbox and some of his favorites in episode 31 of DevNet Snack. Hey, Snackers, Matt Panapoli here. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certification. Welcome to episode 31 of DevNet Snack Minutes. DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that we do here at DevNet. And following from our previous episode where we talked about DevNet sandboxes in general, um, we asked one of our uh, DevNet sandbox engineers to join us today uh, to talk about some of his uh, sandbox experience, some of his favorite sandboxes. So, uh, Mike, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Mike McKay. I'm representing DevNet Sandbox, and I've been at DevNet since DevNet wasn't DevNet, so I'm an old timer. I've been at DevNet hey, since DevNet nice wasn't DevNet. <laughs> Mike and I clearly have worked together for a long time. Um, so Mike, uh, yep. glad to have you here. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, just kind of give us, uh, you know, we, we did an introduction for sandboxes in our previous episode. Can you give us uh, like a, a clue into uh, some of your favorite sandboxes and maybe, um, you know, what you like to use? What I, what I wanted to talk about was we in sandboxes are noticing a sort of a transition in, in how we build sandboxes. Uh, traditionally, sandboxes were a, a technology vertical, 9300, uh, or a wireless LAN controller. What we're starting to notice now is a lot more case-centric uh, sandboxes that are multi-technology. And uh, so those are the really fun ones that we're putting out. We still put out the, uh, the product-specific ones. We've just finished releasing a IR1835. Uh, which replaces the venerable and somewhat old uh, IR829. It's a lot faster and it's got more memory, uh, but it's still a product vertical one. Future releases of that will be integrated with operations dashboard and telemetry. So even things like that are starting to move more into a uh, sort of a solution based as opposed to just a straight vertical. But some of the really fun ones were released lately um, and uh, have taken a massive amount of resources to build. Is the Intersight with Terraform and VMware and uh, Intersight Assist, and that's a, a very, very complicated sandbox that took probably uh, six or seven people almost a month to build. And it contains everything through from uh, some products integrated with Azure for uh, user management, Intersight, uh, Terraform Cloud, uh, VMware, uh, Cisco hypervisors, and, uh, and uh, Hyperflex, et cetera all built and running in a virtualized environment. So we've got virtualized products running inside of a virtualized environment. And on top of that, we're putting in um, IKS, which is a Kubernetes environment on top of the high, top of the line, well, now about three layers of uh, virtualization. So it's, it's quite fun and exciting and somewhat difficult to get working. Another one we've just finished releasing along those lines is an ICE 3.1, which is also uh, a brand new one, once again, fully virtualized. And the advantage with that is it allows us to uh, have more than one instance of each of these sandboxes. If you've got a product specific one, then you can only have as many as we've got the product for. The Intersight one, for example, we've enabled up to 10 instances and we hope to increase that in the future. Intersight, the, sorry, the ICE one, uh, I think we've got like 20 instances maximum set for that. And it's just a resource constraint at the end of the day. Uh, so those are the, would be the fun ones, uh, just because they're very, very complicated. They use a lot of um, technology to bring them up, a lot of uh, Cisco automation hiding in the back end to try and make these guys work, and just stuff that you don't see that you've got no idea how convoluted these things are. Talk to us a little bit and double click on that 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 automation and how we drink kind of uh, kind of drink our own champagne. Uh, so on the Intersight one, we use, so the Terraform and Intersight communicate with each other. And with Terraform, you can instantiate 
uh, services on Intersight using Terraform's uh, APIs, but in fact they're actually run through another product that's sitting inside the data center called Assist. So you've actually got like this uh, Intersight APIs being initiated by Terraform that uh, create things in VMware, for example. So you've got this sort of multi-tiered, uh, multi-layered approach to API usage, which is pretty neat. Uh, in that one there, we also uh, had to do had to do some work with um, single sign-on automation. Uh, so we actually wrote an API to uh, update Azure AD um, accounts to so that as a, when somebody does a reservation, they get given a specific account and specific passwords and we're able to manage passwords. But we did that by writing a custom API into Azure. Uh, once again, it's all API centric. The whole thing is uh, everything is done through APIs and automation and uh, our own back end automation tools. You, you have some particularly interesting um, constraints about what you have to do because instead of having to set up one instance of Intersight, for example, um, you have to have these uh, scenarios where you can have multiple users using the same kind of sandbox and essentially mimicking production. Are there other constraints or, or can you talk about some of the specifics around those constraints that you kind of have to work around that so people can really appreciate what goes into these sandboxes that you guys are building? And talk to us also about security, Mikey, while you're at it, because I think that's that's, that's pretty and that's pretty important for you. Yeah, that's true. It is it is important. So if you sort of look at the this whole sandbox structure, effectively you have a management layer that sits on top and that manages our UCSs, uh, our UCSMs, and our fabric interconnects, and and uh, the V centers, and all that sort of stuff. And then we um, have every single sandbox goes into what's called a pod, and a pod, every single pod, absolutely identical to every other pod. They all use the 10, 10, 20 dot X space, um, and to get in, and that creates this in, this very challenging problem that every dev box on every pod and every sandbox is 10, 10, 20, 50. And so to make all of this work, we then use um, Cisco's NFV uh, services and we use uh, ASAVs, a bunch of acronyms there, but ASAV is just basically a virtual ASA running on top of the uh, NFVs. And that's how everything connects in and keeps everything secure. We then have a secure domain. Um, called shared services, and that's where we run literally shared services. So the DNS and the uh, file servers and everything that's used by every pod has there. And then we have one teeny tiny little hole poked through to that. And the only thing that can access that is the uh, pods through that one IP address and one port uh, to our shared services, which is isolated from the rest of the management domain as well. So we have layers and layers of security, which is um, both good and bad when you're trying to do anything. And uh, then, and that's also the reason why every sandbox has to be accessed, generally speaking, via a VPN, because every IP address is the same 1020.x. And so every time you build something, uh, you have this complexity of uh, no individual IP addresses, everything's identical, uh, and it just makes, which makes automation to a degree easier, but it also makes things very difficult because inside accounts, for example, you, if we've got sandboxes for inside, we have to have 10 inside accounts. And if we've got uh, 10 inside accounts, then we've got to have 10 inside assists. And then each one of those uses <laughs> the same IP address. And then you've got better to, and, and we don't like, for obvious reasons, um, a user that's been given a sandbox to ever be able to get back into that sandbox again once the reservation's finished. So you've somehow got, rather got to remove any accounts that that user used when they come into an Intersight account. So we invite people into Terraform, then we kick them back out again. Uh, we bring Intersight accounts up and down. So it, it gets really complicated, not just on the straight security side, but also in individual users' security accessing and, um, and being kicked back out of reservations. So security is, a, a very large uh, component of trying to build a sandbox safely. So bottom well, line, if, if if you're thinking about getting a, a sandbox for crypto mining, don't, it's not going to work. <laughs> not now. We will track you down, yeah. <laughs> yeah Mike, unfortunately, uh, we're coming up to time here, uh, but before we let you go, can you tell us what superpower 
you would have if you could have one and why? Well, I did come up with the first one, which I thought of, and having known you guys for a few years, it would be helpful to me, and that's the ability to drink forever. Um, oh, goodness. But uh, sorry, that's only, very, <laughs> that's only very useful when I'm out with Matt and, and Kareem, so it's sort of rest of the time, it's not that much fun. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe maybe the ability to control gravity. You know, so oh, that's a good one. You, you can pull that's things awesome. apart, you can join them back together again, you can and you can do whatever you like and even if you're out in space everything's got gravity so you can just take two things and so yeah i don't know Something different. i love that one that's that one's really good and definitely different thanks for sharing your experience with the sandbox for us um you know snackers now that you are, are getting some introductions to the devnet sandbox now you can appreciate what goes into them uh while you're using them so uh go check out our sandboxes at uh, developer.cisco.com sandbox and uh, join us next time for uh, DevNet Snack Minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Snackers. Thanks, Mikey. Thank you. Bye, guys.